Okay, today we're starting on our second lecture of joints. Last time we talked about joint mobility, different types of joints, as well as the different types of joint movements permitted. Today we're going to focus mainly on the joints of the elbow, the shoulder, and also the hip. All of these are synovial joints. We're also going to spend some time talking about joint diseases and joint disorders. Okay, so after you finish today's lecture, you should be able to describe the anatomy of the hip, elbow, shoulder, and knee in detail. You should also be able to describe the factors that affect range of motion. And finally, you should be able to describe different types of joint disorders and injuries, as well as the treatments for these disorders. So to start off, we're going to dive right in and start out with the most complex of the synovial joints, the knee. The knee is actually made up of three different joints, which are surrounded by a single synovial cavity. These include the femoral patellar joint, a plane joint which allows the gliding of the patella over the distal surface of the femur. The patella is secured in place by the quadriceps tendon proximally and the patellar ligament distally. The second two joints are the medial and lateral tibiofemoral joints. These are areas where the convex condyles of the femur articulate with the concave tibial condyles. The tibial condyles are covered with two hyaline cartilages called menisci. These menisci help to increase the area of contact between the tibia and the femur. As you're probably aware, the tibial femoral joints act mostly as a hinge joint, allowing flexion and extension of the knee. However, unlike the elbow, which is purely a hinge joint, the tibial femoral joint also allows some degree of rotation. So the knee rotates medially as you stand, and this allows the tibia and femur to lock into place, enabling you to stand for prolonged periods of time. However, when you flex your knee, as in sitting down, the femur rotates laterally, allowing this joint to unlock. So here you can see a lateral view of the knee. Anteriorly, the patella is held in place by the patellar ligament and tendon. The patella not only protects the deeper structures of the knee, but it also adjusts the angle of pull of the quadriceps tendon to maximize the efficiency of knee extension. The patella is covered with a sac filled with synovial fluid called a bursa. There are also bursae visible just deep to the patellar ligament and tendons. These bursae help to cushion the patellar ligament and tendon as the knee is flexed and extended. Now deep to the kneecap, or patella, you can see the tibiofemoral joint. This joint is held together by a number of ligaments, including the X-shaped cruciate ligaments. If you don't already know, cruciate means crossed or X-shaped. You should be able to notice that the area of contact between the tibia and femur is actually pretty small but it is enhanced by the presence of the menisci, which are cartilage-like structures arising from the head of the tibia, which hug the smooth condyles of the femur, thereby allowing a greater contact between these two bones. This also helps to increase the stability of the knee joint. Now, just like all the other synovial joints, the internal part of the knee is surrounded by a synovial capsule. The wall of this capsule is continuous with the ligaments that are called capsular ligaments, and inside the capsule we have a synovial membrane which secretes synovial fluid. Now, you should remember that synovial fluid is a clear, viscous fluid which helps to lubricate the joints. So here we see a superior view of the head of the tibia. Now, the bowl-shaped medial and lateral menisci are attached to the tibia by something called a transverse ligament. The menisci are made up of hyaline cartilage and are really only partially attached to the tibia, and as a result, they are sometimes torn during sports injuries. As I said previously, the function of the menisci was to allow a greater area of contact between the femoral condyles and the tibial condyles. They are also somewhat spongy, and so they help to absorb impact during running and jumping. Also shown in this picture are the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. These intracapsular ligaments arise from the posterior femur and attach to the anterior and posterior tibia, respectively. Now these ligaments help to prevent the anterior and posterior displacement of the tibia and also hold the femur tightly to the tibia when we're standing. Although they are considered intercapsular ligaments, the synovial membrane actually excludes these ligaments from the synovial cavity. In addition to the intracapsular cruciate ligaments, the knee is also reinforced by capsular ligaments, which are extensions from the synovial capsule, and by extracapsular ligaments, which arise separately. Examples of capsular ligaments include the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate popliteal ligament, whereas the fibular and tibial collateral ligaments are what we call extracapsular ligaments. Together, these ligaments help to prevent uh, abnormal movements in the knee, principally here hyperextension. Here we see an anterior view of the knee with the patella and joint capsule removed. The fibular and tibial collateral ligaments are clearly visible, 
Remember, these are extracapsular ligaments. Not only do they prevent hyperextension of the knee, but they also prevent rotation when the knee is completely extended, for example, when you're standing. On the other hand, this slide shows a more superficial view of the knee with the joint capsule still intact. Here we can see the oblique popliteal ligament, which is actually part of the semimembranosus muscle tendon. The semimembranosus is one of the muscles of our hamstrings. So the oblique popliteus ligament wraps around the posterior surface of the knee and helps to stabilize the joint. Also visible is the arcuate popliteal ligament, which reinforces the joint capsule by connection to the head of the fibula. Also visible but cut or bisected is the popliteus muscle. This was the muscle responsible for unlocking the knee when we go to sit down from a standing position. The knee is truly a remarkable joint. When we're standing, it bears the entire weight of the body. Because it is reinforced with many ligaments and also contains the cartilage menisci, it can endure an amazing amount of vertical compression, for example, when you're running, jumping, or walking, without damage to the joint. However, the knee does have a few weak points. When extended, as it is when you're walking, it is quite susceptible to injury in a horizontal direction. These horizontal blows can result in the tearing of the reinforcing ligaments and cartilages. The three parts of the knee most often damaged are the collateral ligaments, the cruciate ligaments, and the meniscal cartilages. So it's worthwhile to remember the three C's as these are the structures most often damaged during knee injuries which are a result of horizontal or lateral force. So this slide just shows what might happen as a result of a savage blow to the lateral knee. Imagine that you're playing hockey and that you are struck by an errant puck on the lateral aspect of the right knee. Now the immense force caused by this puck will cause tearing of the medial meniscus and also the tibiocollateral ligament. Remember that both the cartilage and ligaments are avascular connective tissue, so they don't do a very good job of healing themselves. In most cases, the torn meniscus will need to be removed and the lateral ligaments repaired surgically. On the other hand, if you twist the knee while running, or even worse, have a frontal blow to the knee, this can result in hyperextension of the knee, which oftentimes cuts or severs the ACL, or anterior cruciate ligament. Like damage to the collateral ligaments, this often needs to be surgically repaired. Most often, this type of surgery is done arthroscopically. Briefly, an arthroscope is inserted into the cavity to visualize the joint. A vertical incision is then made and the damaged ligament removed. The surgeon will then drill a hole into the posterior part of the femur and anterior part of the tibia. They will then unite these bones with a new ligament, usually harvested from the patellar ligament. So the next joint we're going to look at is the shoulder joint. The shoulder is formed by the articulation of the humerus with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. If you remember back to our last lecture, you should recall that the shoulder is an example of a ball and socket joint that allows for multi-axial movement, that is movement in several different planes. So movements permitted by the shoulder include flexion, extension, and hyperextension, as well as abduction, adduction, and circumduction. Now we actually have two different ball and socket joints in the body, one of which is found in the shoulder and the other is found in the hip. In comparison to the hip joint, the shoulder joint is much more flexible. The reason it can be so flexible is that the shoulder is not bearing near as much weight as the hip joint, and so the joint itself doesn't have to be as strong. The joint cavity in the shoulder is much shallower than we find in the hip, and also there's a lot fewer supporting ligaments. And so this allows for a very large range of motion, but at the expense of reduced stability. Shoulders sometimes can and do slip out of place. In this case, it's called luxation, which we'll discuss at the end of the lecture. And injuries to the shoulder joint and rotator cuff are much more common than that of the hip joint. So here we see a frontal section through the shoulder joint. Here you can see the convex head of the humerus fits into the very shallow socket or glenoid cavity of the scapula. Now the glenoid cavity is somewhat deepened by the presence of a fibrocartilage labrum, which is located to the periphery of the glenoid cavity. Just like in other synovial joints, both surfaces of the articulating bones are covered with hyaline cartilage and is surrounded by an articular capsule, which contains synovial fluid. Remember that both hyaline cartilage and the synovial fluid help to reduce the friction between these articulating bones. Now, in comparison to the knee or the hip, there are very few reinforcing ligaments uh, in the shoulder joint. And the absence of ligaments actually helps to contribute to the very large range of motion of the shoulder joint. But remember, we get a large range of motion, but also the shoulder is more prone to injury and luxation.
So most of the reinforcing ligaments are located anteriorly, and these include the coracohumoral ligament, which is really only a thickening of the joint capsule, and the three glenohumoral ligaments. These three ligaments help to somewhat strengthen the joint capsule, but they are actually pretty weak and sometimes even completely absent in some people. In reality, the shoulder actually receives the most support from the muscle tendons that cross the joint. The main support here comes from the tendon arising from the long head of the biceps brachii muscle of the forearm. Remember, your biceps brachii is just your biceps muscle, the muscle on the anterior aspect of your forearm that allows for flexion of the forearm. So the tendon that serves the long head of the biceps actually arises from the superior aspect of the glenoid cavity. It then passes through the joint over the top of the head of the humerus and runs within the intertubercular sulcus and eventually attaches to the biceps muscle. In addition to serving as the origin for the biceps muscle, it also helps to hold the head of the humerus tight inside the glenoid cavity. In addition, tendons of four other muscles wrap around the glenoid cavity, helping to form a deeper concavity which will grip the head of the humerus. And the muscles and tendons that make up the rotator cuff include the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and also the teres minor. So this is just a superficial view of the joint capsule surrounding the glenohumoral joint, which is the joint formed between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus, otherwise known as the shoulder. And again, one of our main reinforcing ligaments are the coracohumoral ligament, but the main structure that actually helps to hold the head of the humerus into the glenoid fossa of the scapula is actually our tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle. This actually wraps around the head of the humerus and runs through something called a tendon sheath until it arises from the proximal part of the humerus and connects the long head of the biceps muscle. And of course we can have those three glenohumoral ligaments which further help to stabilize the joint. Just like we saw in other synovial joints, there are bursae or sacs filled with synovial fluid which help to cushion tendons and ligaments as they run across the joint. Okay, so this photo just shows a lateral to medial view of the glenoid cavity. As we said previously, the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa is actually a very shallow cavity, but the depth of this socket is marginally increased by the presence of a fibrocartilage labrum around the joint. Outside that labrum is something called the rotator cuff. Now remember, the rotator cuff is actually formed from the tendons of four different muscles, and these are muscles that are attached to or acting on the scapula. The rotator cuff helps to increase the depth of the socket and also increases joint stability. As you're probably aware, the rotator cuff can be torn or damaged. We often see this in people like cheerleaders, swimmers, baseball players, etc. These are athletes that endure injury to the rotator cuff as a result of vigorous and repeated uh, circumduction of the shoulder. Now the primary treatment for these injuries is something called RICE. RICE is an acronym which stands for rest, icing, compression, and elevation. And these are four ways to limit the swelling or inflammation that occurs and therefore reduce the amount of pain and loss of range of motion. Now, unlike injuries to the knee, surgery is usually not necessary for a torn rotator cuff. Most times we're just going to rest that arm and maybe give some NSAIDs to reduce inflammation and reduce pain and hopefully let it heal on its own. Now, in some cases, surgery may actually be required. In these cases, the surgeon will usually go in and remove the damaged parts of the rotator cuff because they can interfere with joint movement. They will also remove any bone spurs that are formed. Bone spurs are just bony outgrowths of the surface of the bone that arise when we have two bones that are rubbing against each other without the benefit of synovial fluid or hyaline cartilage. So our next joint is the elbow. The elbow is formed by the articulation of the humerus with the proximal parts of the radius and the ulna. Remember the elbow is a hinge joint which allows flexion and extension, but usually does not permit hyperextension. Although we said in the last slide that three bones form the elbow joint, really only two of these bones form tight connections, that is the humerus and the ulna. So here you can see the articulation of the trochlea, a condyle-like structure of the humerus, with the trochlear notch of the ulna. Located on either side of the trochlear notch is a raised prominence, the coronoid process anteriorly and the olecranon process posteriorly. These prominences or lips help to increase the depth of the notch and prevent luxation of the trochlea from the ulnar notch. The elbow joint is covered with a loose articular capsule over which the tendons of the biceps and brachialis muscles run anteriorly and the triceps brachii muscle tendon runs posteriorly.
The tendon of the triceps brachii muscle connects to the olecranon process, which when contracted allows for extension of the elbow. The contraction of the biceps muscle and also the brachialis muscle allows for flexion of the elbow. Just like we saw in the other joints, synovial fluid filled bursae are located deep to the tendons of each of these muscles. And again, the purpose of these bursae is to allow for a friction free movement of these tendons uh, across the joint. Now, unlike what we saw in the knee joint, which had a lot of supporting ligaments, there are very few supporting ligaments in the elbow, so it's quite similar in this sense to the shoulder joint. So the main ligaments that stabilize the elbow include the annular ligament and the two capsular ligaments, including the ulnar collateral ligament and the radial collateral ligament. So remember that the articular capsule of the elbow is quite loose, allowing for a very free range of motion in flexion and extension. However, there are two collateral ligaments which prevent side-to-side -side movements of the joint. These include the radial collateral ligament, shown here, and the ulnar collateral ligament, shown here. In addition, an annular ligament surrounds the head of the radius. The function of this ligament is to hold the radial head tight against the side of the ulna, though luxations or dislocations sometimes do occur, as we'll see towards the end of the lecture. Our last joint is the hip joint. The hip joint is formed by the articulation of the coxal bones, which themselves are formed by three bones, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, with the head of the femur. The cavity that accepts the head of the femur is called the acetabulum. Now, unlike the glenoid cavity of the scapula or shoulder, the acetabulum is quite deep. It is also rimmed by a ring of fiber cartilage called the acetabular labrum, which further enhances the depth of the acetabulum. In addition, the hip joint is stabilized by a number of strong ligaments, so as a result, dislocations or luxations of the hip are quite rare. Here we can see a frontal section of the hip joint. As you can see, the head of the femur fits quite snugly into the acetabulum, and it's surrounded completely on all sides by a thickened articular capsule. Just like we saw in other synovial joints, the articular cavity is filled with synovial fluid, and the head of the femur and also the rim of the acetabulum have thick layers of hyaline cartilage on them. Now both the cartilage and the synovial fluid help to reduce friction between the femur and the coxal bones during hip movement. Within the joint capsule, you can see a ligament connecting the head of the femur to the lower part of the acetabulum. This is called the ligamentum teres. Now, because it is normally slack during most movements of the hip, it probably does little to reinforce or stabilize the hip joint, but it does contain an artery which does help to supply oxygen-rich blood to the head of the femur. If this ligament is damaged, this can result in intense pain and arthritis of the hip joint. So four ligaments help to reinforce the joint capsule surrounding the hip joint. These include the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, and the ligamentum teres. We've already talked a little bit about the ligamentum teres, so we'll focus mainly on the other three ligaments. The iliofemoral ligament is a strong V-shaped ligament found on the posterior aspect of the joint capsule. As the name implies, this connects the femur, specifically the greater trochanter, to the ilium, which makes up the superior portion of the acetabulum. Also seen in this photo is the ischiofemoral ligament. The ischiofemoral ligament is a spiral ligament connecting the greater trochanter to the inferior portion of the acetabulum. If we take a look at the anterior view of the hip, we can also see the pubofemoral ligament, which unites the lesser trochanter to the pubic arch. Now together, these four ligaments help to reinforce the joint capsule and screw the head of the femur into the acetabulum when a person is standing. Although several muscles and muscle tendons do also cross the hip joint and contribute somewhat to its stability, the main anatomical structure that prevents hip dislocation is the deep acetabulum as well as the strong capsular ligaments which surround it. So to close out this lecture, we're going to talk about some joint diseases and disorders that affect many types of synovial joints. And the first one of these are sprains. Sprains are injuries where the reinforcing ligaments of a synovial joint are either stretched or, at worst, torn. And this can be a problematic because remember these ligaments are composed of dense regular connective tissue which is poorly vascularized and as a result tends to heal slowly or not at all. In cases where the ligaments are completely torn, there are mm, maybe two or three options. Firstly, we can sew the damaged ends of the ligaments together. Again, this is going to be a surgery. Or we can replace the ligament entirely with grafts. 
probably the least desirable option is just to immobilize the joint and see if it will heal with time. Again, because these ligaments are poorly vascularized, they don't tend to heal very well on their own. Another type of injury affecting synovial joints are luxations, otherwise known as dislocations. During a luxation, the bones are forced out of their normal alignment. And this is usually accompanied by sprains, which is damage to the ligaments and tendons, and results in inflammation, uh, difficulty moving the joint, and of course a lot of pain. Now, oftentimes dislocations can be caused by serious falls or contact sport injuries, but in some cases we can get dislocations or luxations uh, in young children as a result of maybe just pulling on their arm too hard. So up top you can see an example of a luxation in the elbow joint. Here the radius has come out of its normal position. And in order to repair this, we're going to have to do something called reduction. Reduction is the placement of bones back into their normal orientation. And so whether we have a compound fracture or some kind of dislocation, uh, one of the primary treatments is going to be reduction, putting that bone back into its initial position. Finally, there's also something called subluxation. Subluxation is a partial dislocation of joint. And some people are more prone to subluxation than others. They have maybe weak muscle mass. Uh, they have thinner tendons and ligaments than other people. And so they tend to have joints that are more prone to subluxating than others. Our next disorder is arthritis. Remember that arthros refers to joints and itis is an inflammation. And so what we have here is an inflammation of the joints. And there are over a hundred different types of inflammatory and degenerative diseases that are classified as arthritis. It actually tends to be the most widespread and crippling disease all throughout the United States. So of course symptoms of arthritis include swelling, pain, and stiffness, and also a reduced range of motion. There are two different groups of arthritis, the acute forms which come on very suddenly, and oftentimes these are caused by bacteria which can be treated and cleared up with antibiotics. On the other hand, the chronic forms are much more common. Chronic forms are forms that develop over time, and they include things like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. And so the first type of arthritis we're going to talk about is osteoarthritis, abbreviated OA. This is caused when the cartilage in overworked joints is destroyed and it results in, of course, exposure of the bone ends, which due to stress become enlarged and thickened, forming bony spurs. These bony spurs are quite painful and this often results in pain, swelling, and of course, a reduction in the range of motion. Osteoarthritis is really one of those chronic diseases that is age-related. By about age 85, half of Americans will have some form of osteoarthritis. And indeed, you can develop osteoarthritis as early as your 40s or 50s. Now, there are several different treatments for osteoarthritis. If the loss in range of motion is really bad, and if basically we're not able to go on, we can do a joint replacement, which we'll talk about at the end of the lecture. But we can also treat osteoarthritis with anti-inflammatories and other drugs. Now, in the past few years, various supplements have been advertised to cure or treat osteoarthritis. And these include substances like glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. Now, it's important to realize that these are supplements. They have not been evaluated by the FDA. We don't know anything about their efficacy or safety. More recent trials by independent researchers have indicated that these supplements uh, don't do anything to cure osteoarthritis. That is, when we compare them in a double-blind study to a placebo, they don't result in any reduction in pain or any increase in range of motion. Now, despite this, many Americans do, in fact, take these supplements. Our next type of arthritis is called rheumatoid arthritis, or RA. This is a chronic inflammatory disease caused by an inappropriate autoimmune response. That is, where the body's own immune system attacks its own cells. And we're not really sure what causes this autoimmune disease, but it usually arises between the ages of 40 and 50, but could occur at any age. And in general, it affects women three times more frequently than it does men. Signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis include joint pain, inflammation and swelling, anemia, osteoporosis, and muscle weakness. There could also be associated cardiovascular problems. Now, one thing that can differentiate rheumatoid arthritis from osteoarthritis is that the arthritis here is usually bilateral, meaning it affects joints on both sides of the body. On the other hand, in osteoarthritis, let's say if you have a bad hip or something like that due to overuse, uh, oftentimes that will just affect one side of the body. So one of the first conditions in rheumatoid arthritis is something called synoviitis, which is inflammation of the synovial cavity. 
Here we have inflammatory blood cells that are migrating into the joint, releasing uh, cytokines and other inflammatory chemicals that basically destroy the tissues within the joint cavity. In addition, synovial fluid will further accumulate in the joint, leading to joint swelling and an inflamed synovial membrane. Now, as this synovial membrane becomes inflamed and does so chronically, it will eventually thicken into something called a panis. The panis is a piece of tissue that will cling to the articular cartilages of the touching bones and will eventually erode that cartilage, uh, further leading to increased pain and inflammation of the joint. And eventually, that scar tissue that's left behind will actually connect the articulating bones into a non-movable structure called an ankylosis. And so at the right hand side of the screen you can see an example of rheumatoid arthritis that affects the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Here this person has sort of a claw-like hand, uh, probably very reduced range of motion and a lot of pain. Now unlike osteoarthritis, we usually can't treat rheumatoid arthritis surgically because it affects joints bilaterally and it also affects many joints in the body. And so there's a few different strategies we can use. First of all, we need to disrupt the destruction of joints by the immune system. And we can do this using steroids, for example, prednisone, uh, or we can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs just to reduce the inflammation. Examples of NSAIDs include things like aspirin and ibuprofen and so on. Another strategy is to actually use immunomodulator drugs to suppress the immune system, and this will suppress the autoimmune response that is responsible for damaging the joints in the first place. And in a few cases, we can actually replace the joints with prosthetic joints. But again, because RA tends to affect many joints in the body, this only solves part of the problem. So to close out this lecture, I just want to say something briefly about joint replacements because it is definitely a big business in the medical field. Here we're dealing with people that have worn out their joints or need to have joints replaced because they've been damaged in sports or because they have rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. And so a lot of joints in the body can be replaced, things such as the elbow, the knee, and also the hip. The hip is probably the most frequently replaced joint in the body. And so on the left hand side of the screen you can see a normal hip that involves the coxal bones or hip bones that articulates with the head of the femur. Now through osteoarthritis the cartilages covering the head of the femur and the acetabulum can break down and this causes some pain, some inflammation, and also a loss of range of motion. So if we have a very osteoarthritic joint we can do a replacement. And this replacement, if it's called a total hip, involves not only replacing the acetabulum, but also replacing the head of the femur. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see what an x-ray would look like for somebody that's had one of these hip replacements. Now, chances are you probably know somebody that's had a hip replaced. It's a very common surgery. And we can do that surgery uh, in the traditional way, which involves a very large incision. And we can also do something called a minimally invasive hip surgery. So below are two links to different videos of hip replacement surgeries. If you have time, go ahead and click on both of them and at least watch a few minutes of the surgery. What you'll notice is that these surgeries are much like carpentry. They involve a lot of force. Uh, the surgeon has to give muscle relaxers, luxate the joint, and then soft the head of the femur, and then replace that with a prosthetic joint. And then, of course, they have to reduce that or put it back into the normal location. So please do take a look at the links below. I probably won't test you on these on exam, but they still are fascinating examples of surgery.